So once we have our skeletal sketch and we understand its components, now we can start thinking about what references would work. And you can do a lot of different things. Like I could do crocodile hands. I could do fire as a, as a main, as a transition though that's a figurative element and using a figurative element that you expect to move independently of your creature will, might be more difficult than it's worth. Um, I'm thinking deer legs. I'm thinking like an enlarged bunny tail. I'm thinking a wolf body, yellow fern and fungus mane, river otter cranium, fox mandible, badger forearms. And I always try to make it simple and I always end up obsessing and, and making it complicated because I, I enjoy it. And I kind of invest in it. So a way to think of creature design, it has to be believable. And that starts with the skeleton. If it's not believable, it just looks like a, a collage of different features. It doesn't look like it can move. And we want it to move because we, we want to have the option to animate it later. So if you, if you do on the home page of Canvas, you skip right to assignments to just get the basic assignment sheets. This is where I'll start putting, for certain assignments, certain uh, resources. So this is a professional process exploration in creature design. Creature design is one of those really, really fun careers that's entirely based on illustration and more and more on, on digital illustration. And when I was in college learning, learning how to be an illustrator, uh, someone that they had, an alumni they had come talk to us at the Art Center College of Design was Crash McCurry. And Crash McCurry is the designer of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. He also designed the 1994 Godzilla. So they're not all winners, right? But he was an expert at making believable fantasy creature designs. And the way he worked was just with a mechanical pencil, you know, a 0.5 mechanical pencil on illustration board. And he would draw things from the side and he would draw them in his mechanical pencil. First, the skeleton, looking at lots of different reference and building the skeleton, then the muscle structure, and then the details on top of that. And that's all the, the Stan Winston studio who he works for, the effect house. That's all they needed to make a practical T-Rex animatic robot that was the real size that it is in the movie because they thought they were going to do that before they did all the digital stuff but because of the limitations of that big robot it looked perfect and the best shots of the movie are still with that robot it wasn't able to run it wasn't able to do anything except like attack a jeep right and so then they used the same drawings that Stan, that uh, crash mccurry did even though they were just in pencil and they were able to, they were detailed enough and believable enough that they could make a 3D model from the skeleton forward. And then we have some of our first most believable digital creature design. So this is an artist named RJ Palmer, who most recently, uh, I thought it was appropriate for this project, did the creature designs for the Detective Pikachu movie, which is trying to make very believable Pokemon, right? And his work is always about understanding the actual skeletal structure, right? So this is a good example. Charizard, the beloved Pokemon, is a little goofy in how it's drawn because there's no muscles for the wings, right? The wings are stuck on kind of like fairy wings or angel wings or butterfly wings. But there's no musculature to support it. So when he actually has to think about how that's going to work in three-dimensional space, you know, in a believable world, you actually have to build one set of, of pectoral muscles for the wings and one set for the arms. And so that lengthens the rib cage significantly. So if you think of the basic shapes, think how large that rib cage is. And I would have changed this silhouette a little bit, though it makes it harder to fit on screen with other creatures by making those wings a lot larger. <laughs> so it's more like a Game of Thrones dragon. But then it gets away from the silhouette of Charizard more and more. So some creature designs are easier and harder to think through this way. Some creature designs are based on, on non-vertebrates, right? H.R. Geiger's uh, Aliens for the Ridley Scott movie and then the James Cameron like sequel, they're all based on 
bug designs on exoskeletons, but they still have the same structure of a vertebrate, right? So details don't matter as much as silhouette and proportion. This is true of kind of fantasy creatures and dragons and basically anything we can imagine is based on things that exist, just combined in new and interesting ways. Another, if you really get into creature design, another really great skill is to start physically modeling. And this is used by digital artists all the time, especially 3D modeling artists. You just do little wireframe experiments. So this is using pipe cleaners to kind of figure out where all the connections are so that you can bend it around in space and understand how the silhouette's gonna work as it moves. So this is a really beautiful dragon design here, but you really have to think of it from the skeleton on forward. And it's not so that you get every detail. It's so that you understand what, where things are connecting, how things should be proportioned, so that when it's posed, it sells the illusion. So for a believable fantasy landscape, you need foreground, middle ground, background. For a believable creature design, you need a skeletal structure that's easy to understand and clear from any angle. And that usually has to do with strong decisions, right? Is this character more about the front, the top of the body or the bottom of the body? It's more about the top. Is this creature more about the top of the body or the bottom of the body? It's all about the head, right? If T-Rex actually had stronger arms, it would be a much less compelling silhouette. It's really that contrast of the huge, powerful head, the tiny little arms that make it such an intimidating creature. Okay. So you have access to the slides. You can kind of look through the process. You can research it on your own. And this is actually an example of a past student's uh, final presentation. So each of you will get a chance to highlight a digital artist working today in your final presentations and show us their process and the work that they do that you like. So you'll find that under assignments. Okay, so let's continue. We've got our sketch. We've got this stage. Now we gotta find reference. We have to research and save high resolution reference. Pixabay is a great source for this. So if I look up bunny tail on Pixabay, I'm going to get bunnies, but actually no pictures of their tails, because it can be hard to get creatures to do what you want. And I get a costume with a tail, but then I also get sometimes random things, like this type of grass that is sometimes called a bunny tail, like a cat's tail, right? And if I have a skeletal structure, there's no reason I can't use this as an element. So I often will use like flora along with my fauna when looking for things. I can also sometimes use food because there's a lot of food photography out there, right? So if there's a type of food like a head of broccoli that might make a really good tail, I might research that. We're looking for reference images that are at least a thousand pixels. The bigger, the better and Pixabay will always give you that option. And then you download them, and then you need to organize them. This is what I recommend. So for all those, those areas of the creature that I've identified as needing, I need claws from one source, I need legs from one source, I need head from two sources, I need the body from one source, I need the tail from one source. Remember, you're required to have at least five. Uh, then I want to start organizing the references I find. So for the head, I want to combine a fox and an otter. And then every once in a while, I'll find something that's not what I was looking for, but fits the bill. Because you've done the sketch, now you start looking for the head at that angle. Or that can be tilted to that angle. So I have some good candidates here. I have a fox, an otter a wolf and a wolverine head, all at the right angle. And remember, they can be flipped if needed. So that's, and that all of them are high enough resolution and sharp focus that they will work for my needs. 
I do not like to just use the head of one animal and put it on the body of another animal. I like to always change the cranium and the mandible to, so I have more kind of control of transforming it. For the body, I've got my skinny wolf body. My favorite reference for that is this one, which actually has a great mouth as well, which I might use. But that's a skinny wolf for sure. This pose is not great, but this definitely shows more emphasis on the front end of the creature, which is what I want in my creature design. And then I've got others to kind of uh, flesh it out. I've got the, the badger feet and the color. So get a lot of good quality reference that you can use, either through large Google images that you make sure don't have watermarks and make sure are high quality, or through Pixabay. I've got deer legs. And in searching for this, I found a type of, of dog breed that has kind of a perfect combination of deer and dog proportions in the legs. If I can find them at the right angle or build them at the right angle, especially where the hips are, then I'm in luck. But then I've also got the deer. Reindeer is a little stocky. You find what you can find. And for the forearms, this is the hardest part of most creature design is getting feet. Because animals always have their feet covered, right? So looking for badgers, looking for wolverines. I found this other kind of rodent creature with pretty distinguished feet that I can maybe put claws onto. This is the kind of reference that's helpful to you. You're always looking at the angle. And remember that you can always flip it. You can always flip it horizontally and transform it to match your angle. But you can't like turn a profile into a three-quarter view. So you need an angle that's close enough. And really detailed shots like this can help if they're at the right angle. All right, so now I've got enough references to get started. I've organized them. We have to set up our file. So I'm gonna bring in my sketch. I'm gonna go ahead and collapse these, merge these two together. So this is now my sketch. That's the first thing you're gonna post in Canvas, just like we did for our landscape. You wanna post your sketch. So I'm gonna go ahead and update that because that is your master plan. They're your blueprints. Not only what kind of references you had in mind originally before you started looking, but also the all important kind of angle of the skeleton. And remember, as long as you post something about your process before the deadline, you'll be able to resubmit for a better grade any time in the semester, up until our, our last week of class. So there's my sketch. The next step is to start mapping references to this, like we did with our landscape. So I open up my sketch in Photoshop. I want to check its image size. I want it to be at least 8 by 10 by 300 pixels per inch, but ideally 11 by 14 by 350 pixels per inch. So I'm gonna make mine 11 by however wide it's gonna be. So it's gonna be 11 by 17 by 350 pixels per inch. It softens it a little, but it still works. And now I'm going to use my move tool with my rulers set to inches, and I'm gonna map the corners of it just so I know what that original size is. It's actually more like this. So it'll be closer to 11 by 14 than 11 by 17. And now I'm going to go to image canvas size. And I'm going to grow it to be 40 inches.